Welcome back to Cause Talk Radio, another true story from True Story FM. I'm your host, Megan Strand with Engage for Good. You can find full show notes and additional resources for today's episode at engageforgood.com. Duncan's Joy in Childhood Foundation has a mission to bring joy to kids battling hunger or illness. When COVID hit, they quickly realized they needed to make grants available to local organizations to ensure those who needed food could get it. But that's not all they did. In this episode of Cause Talk Radio, my guest is Carrie McHugh, Executive Director of the Joy in Childhood Foundation. Carrie outlines many of the ways the organization is spreading joy, from simply delivering cups of coffee to first responders, to helping them recharge and heal from the trauma of a global pandemic through their new Hero Recharge program. We also learn about the foundation's work with incredible therapy dogs in hospital settings and how consumers are invited to support this program through a partnership with BarkBox. There are a lot of impressive efforts happening right now to help vulnerable populations, and the Joy in Childhood Foundation is a prime example of some of the good being done in the world. Well, we have so much to jump into today. It sounds like the Duncan Joy and Childhood Foundation has been incredibly busy, probably as always, but maybe even a little bit more so with COVID. So maybe you can take us back to like March-ish, and I would love to hear what happened in your world when COVID-19 hit. Like what what happened to the foundation? What stuff did you have to pivot? What stuff were you able to plow forward? Like what what happened? So, I mean, what a strange time, even a strange time to think back on now, Um, you know, in mid-March, I think like everybody else, we were trying to figure out, is this a short, medium or long-term problem? Um, You know, are we canceling, are we canceling grant? I mean, are we canceling events? Um, The actual week uh, after quarantine was set in, um, or when the idea of quarantine was kind of coming about we had a full week of volunteer events across the country to help support, um, I know, to help support <laughs> um, a food bank. So it's a time where our, consu- where our crew members and our franchisees and employees come together and work in food banks to help sort and kind of, you know, really touch the work of the foundation. Um, and interestingly, because we had to cancel so many of those, um, it was like literally, it's like Monday, Tuesday, and we're like looking at the next day of canceling. Um, and, you know, trying to be, to handle the situation safely and appropriately while still being aware that these nonprofits were expecting us. Um, it ended up being fortuitous because in talking to the nonprofits um, at that first week, we learned a lot about how this was impacting them, um, which kind of set us up for our first round of grant making after COVID. So I'd say right after COVID happened, we had to, you know, we did a lot of pivoting um, partly because it was right in our face. And then we learned a lot from the, um, food banks and from the feeding programs that enabled us to turn on a, uh, a little more than a million dollars for the funding that, that like next week. Which is pretty incredible. So you guys did one point, was it $1.25 million in grants specifically for hunger, correct? Yeah. So, I mean, one thing that happened with the feeding in the, in the feeding community was, um, with COVID, they suddenly didn't have any volunteers. Their distribution systems were off. Um, a lot of these organizations get food from um, restaurants and grocery stores. I mean, and think about this beginning of COVID. The grocery stores are being, uh, there's no food in the grocery stores, so there's definitely no salvage. The restaurants are closing, the trucks aren't moving, and the volunteers aren't coming. So right at the same time that suddenly there's all this fear of schools closing and where are kids going to get their food and um, you know, how are families going to be able to adjust? All of the resources for these organizations are also being plowed. Um, so we did announce the 1.25 million in grants that were highly flexible. The grant questions, I think there were five and they were brief, um, to enable flexible funding for these organizations, um, which we did the second week of March, but we gave them a, we started cutting checks 24 hours after wow. we opened, um, the grant. 
That's incredible. Well, we're now in September and September is Hunger Action Month. Uh, and it sounds like to kind of piggyback on this grant conversation, it sounds like the Joy and Childhood Fo- Foundation has made an additional $1 million in grants available. So what's different with this round of funding? I know you've got um, some more specific folks that you're targeting this time around. So what's what's happening in September? So I think in sep- the, this round of funding, I mean, I wouldn't say that there's I wouldn't say it's significantly different because Mm -hmm. it is still very flexible funding for local feeding programs. I think the focus on local is bigger than uh, it was the first time around, um, partly as we understand that that's where people are really getting their food from. Um, So we're looking at uh, local community programs and we'll be donating, you know, grants probably between the range of five and $50,000. Nice. Um, well, you're also inviting Duncan guests to join in on a fundraising effort um, for the foundation. So what's happening in stores? How are you inviting folks to help you out in this in this push? So there are a couple of different options. Um, people can go to bringjoy.org and make a donation, um, which can go directly to the hunger relief grants. Um, they can also go to coffeebreak.com. And when they purchase a Hunger Action Month um a gift card they for you know a friend or family they uh duncan will donate a dollar to the foundation and they also have an option to make a donation um our big fundraiser really is in november in store and um i'll give a plug for that because we're definitely Please. concerned when people are not inside the restaurant right. that um that that's going to uh suffer and it's a you know really significant way that we raise money for the foundation and that's a point of sale donation where you ask people to donate a flat amount or round up or whatever it is. It's a dollar. It's a Got dollar it. donation for um, uh, as part of a Sprinkle Joy program. Um, they it. do get a coupon back for donuts. Well, that's good. <laughs> There should always be a donut included in all programs. Right. Well, speaking of donuts uh, and coffee, you're Duncan. So let's also talk of, about a couple of other things that you've been doing during COVID. You obviously got coffee into the hands of some people who could who could use it. So can you share a little bit about delivering coffee around the country during this crisis and who you've been targeting there? Yeah. So that, I mean, there have been... I've gotten to work in some really powerful programs while I was at Duncan, but I will say... Um, bringing coffee and donuts to the emergency workers mm. at the beginning of COVID was um, a spectacular experience. Um, I think that uh, working for an organization that has products that bring joy is um, is always fun. But once COVID, when COVID started and everybody was locked down and there was so much fear in the hospitals. Um, people going to the hospitals, people who are working in the hospitals and PPE, um, to show up with giant trucks making coffee and donuts. And, you know, on a Sunday morning, the Sunday morning shift at um, Mass General Hospital, Mm. you know, serving a thousand people coffee and donuts, nurses and, and emergency workers. It's incredible. I mean, people... It was just, it was incredible to bring joy when things were so scary and yeah. dark. Um, and, you know, I picked one example. We actually, um, we actually gave, made and handed out hundreds of thousands of cups of coffee and bakery products across the country, predominantly New York and Boston, um, at the very beginning of COVID within the first few weeks, um, we took our sampling trucks and went anywhere we really could any of the hospitals we could get into um, safely. Yeah, I love um, that. Well, just being able to feel cool. like you're you're making a little teeny bit of a difference, like when everyone's like, oh my gosh, what is happening? You know, you're like, I've got right. coffee and donuts, you know? Yes, just, well, it's gotta feel it good. is. It was like, it was like, you know, people are coming out of their shifts and, and people are dying. I mean, these are really yeah, it's very serious. difficult times for yeah. these uh, emergency workers. And to just kind of have a moment to be like, we love you. Like, thank you. Um, have a hup- cup of coffee. Um, yeah. It was powerful. It was more powerful than I would have um, expected. I mean, I think it was powerful for us, but I also think it made a big difference to um, the nurses and, and medical professionals. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you're also doing something unique that I haven't heard of before called Hero Recharge. Can you, speaking mm-hmm. of first responders, can you tell us a little bit about what that program is and why you decided to um, launch it? Or I don't, is it actually launched yet? Well, tell us what it is mm-hmm. first and then tell us where, where you are in the in the launch process. 
So Hero Recharge was created uh, exclusively because of COVID um, and, and wanting to do something um, to help with the post-traumatic stress that emergency workers were going through. Um, and so we really, you know, we did some homework to try to understand what was available for emergency workers um, and, and what their experience was like. Um, you know, not during COVID necessarily, because, you know, nobody really knows yet, but going back and looking at what it was like for death of patients, um, or working in really high stress environments. And what we learned is there's not a ton going on to support, um, you know, particularly nurses. So at the time, I think we were looking a lot at nurses, but it does encompass all emergency workers. And so, um, we actually reached out to some organizations that we work with that have camps, um, for kids who have cancer and, and, uh, bereaved families. So thinking of similar experience of, you know, um, you know, a level of medical PTSD, um, and because these camps were empty because nobody, none of the kids can go to camp this year. Right. Right. So, um, started talking to them to try to figure out what might work, uh, got in touch with, um, this really incredible, um, organization called first descent, um, who is headquartered in Colorado, but works across the country. And, you know, it was fortuitous. They literally were in exactly the same spot, um, trying to figure out what could be done. What they do is adventure programming, typically for kids who had, have, or had cancer, um, in a highly supportive, but, you know, adventure based, uh, support. So you think rock climbing, think, you know, uh, whitewater rafting, yeah. um, they I do multi-day go. events. Yeah, I'm totally. Nice. That's <laughs> Looking at these photographs makes you like more aware of the fact that you're locked in your house. I know, I know. Uh, So we worked with them. We actually gave them um, a pretty substantial grant and to create programming for emergency workers. That first event um, did just happen in... um, Actually, the first one happened in Colorado. uh, I think it was last week. But we have events that are coming up in New York, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, um, 1,500... Nurses and healthcare professionals um, immediately reached out, and um, these events are going to be happening for the next few months. And That's they're not events; amazing. some of them are overnights, um, some of them are one day, some are overnights. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it depends on the circumstance. But the point is just to give them a break, a mental break, and help them maybe heal just a little bit from the trauma they've been through. Right? Like that's the that's and the to connect. Of the program. Connect with other healthcare Connect workers people and, yeah. who have been in the same kind of traumatic experiences and give them a chance to, you know, where it's okay to really kind of talk about it. Yeah, I love that. I feel like I might need to hear more about that in the future. Okay, but we've got other things to talk about here. Um, some of the other things, Every as I was doing some research for the podcast, I was like, oh my gosh, and they're doing this and they're doing that and they're doing this. And then one of my most favorite, the talk about joy, um, you're also getting our four-legged friends involved as well. So can you tell us what your partnership with Bark is all about? Um, oh, and, dog uh, toys. What's happening with the dog toys and how adorable they are. Maybe you could describe what they are and what you're doing with them and how they're benefiting the foundation. And where I can get one because they're pretty stinking cute. (laughs) uh, I bet we know where we can get you a Megan. Uh, (laughs) So in order to explain the dog toys and Duncan selling dog toys, I have to tell you about the uh, Dogs for Joy program. Right. Yes. So the... um, about two years ago, we took a look at the funding that we were doing within hospitals um, to bring joy to kids. And in order to do that... um, you know, as an organization, I think we feel like it's really important to talk to people who are recipients um, to understand what does really bring them joy, what does make an impact, as opposed to what I think often happens, particularly in corporate foundations, where you kind of sit around and talk about what you think would be great <laughs> if you were a kid in a hospital. Um, and and so we really went out there. We talked to kids, we talked to parents, we talked to palliative care teams, doctors, nurses. Um, across the country to say, you know, what brings joy and what has kind of a lasting impact? Um, you know, don't, uh, one of the doctors said to us, uh, don't be window dressing. So in other words, you know, mm. don't just be a great photograph, yeah. um, do something that lasts. Um, and this strange, like, um, there was a strange tie between a lot of the conversations about therapy dogs. Um, mm. 
And so it kind of kept coming back. And um, so we set part to research what was going on with therapy dogs and discovered this, you know, somewhat cutting edge work in the dog dog world, which is dogs that don't visit hospitals, but they live in pediatric hospitals. Oh, cool. Yeah. So the dog, it doesn't sleep there. People always ask that. It goes home at night with uh, <laughs> their their primary parent or their secondary. There's usually a primary and secondary parent. They might be a doctor or a child life specialist, um, you know, a chaplain. Um, and the dog goes to work with that person every day and becomes part of the clinical team. Mm. Um, and these dogs, um, they are full service dogs. So they've been trained for, you know, typically around two years. Um, they're super expensive. They're between twenty five and fifty thousand dollars. Oh, my gosh. Um, the dogs, so the dogs for joy program, uh, funded last year, we funded a million dollars worth of, uh, worth of dogs. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> we funded hospitals <laughs> about a million dollars in order to bring dogs in. Um, and their funding would last for three years and hopes that within those three years, they can get additional funding to keep the dogs. Um, even actually last week, I think we announced three new ones. Um, Dilly who's at shop, um, Bob who went to Tufts medical and Lita, who's at OU Medical Center. Um, so that's your Dogs for Joy program. In order to fundraise, we uh, worked with a company called Bark uh, or Bark Box, mm -hmm. and they make these terrific dog toys. Um, and together we designed um, one that is in the shape of a Duncan cup um, that squeaks. Um, and the other is, it's actually really, it's a fantastic dog toy. Um, looks like a munchkin box, um, it's, you know, and it's got a squishy noise to it. But the dog, when the dog opens the munchkin box, there are three squeaky munchkins on the inside. Oh, my gosh. I love that. Um, both of these toys are a gift with donation uh, in restaurants. So um, I think one is $12 and the munchkin box, I think, is 15 um, But do call ahead because they did sell out really fast. There, I do know there's quite a few still out in the restaurants. Um, but people should call ahead uh, to make sure that they have them. That's fantastic. I love that. Well, we only have a couple minutes left. So I want to ask you just, can you reflect quickly, Carrie, on what you have personally learned through COVID as it relates to your work at the foundation? Like what's been the most meaningful to you or impactful as you kind of reflect back on the past five or six months? I mean, I think so many, I think I've learned so much over the last five months. Um, I mean, for one thing, I think we've learned a lot about each other's personal lives. Um, and I, I can say that humorously and just in that we see into each other's lives, but also I think uh, have seen more than ever the struggles individuals go through on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. by the fact that we are interacting, uh, you know, in each other's houses. Um, and I would extend that to the foundation um, to say, you know, the relationships that we built enabled us to have really honest conversations with our grantees, um, then to take all the veneer off so that we could figure out what they really needed. Um, and so I think I feel really lucky that we had strong relationships and that that could happen. Um, because I do think we've been able to make a much bigger difference because of it for, you know, by being able to hear what was needed and then be flexible in our response. Um, and then just overall, I think uh, trust has been a bigger factor than ever since COVID started. Um, and being able to give funding and trust the organization to execute that funding, um, as opposed to 40 questions and spreadsheets and <laughs> contracts, um, really basic questions. I mean, yeah. uh, our grants at the moment are really basic. What would you want to use the money for? <laughs> How yeah. much money do you need what to do What is your that? name? How do we get you it's, the check? <laughs> well, the first three questions really are like, what is your 501c3? I yeah. legally need to have that certificate. Exactly. Uh, but really basic and trusting people that they're going to do really the right thing. Um, I think it's probably the positive, the positive things I'd say are the relationships and the trust um, have come out of this. Super important. Well, Carrie, thank you so, so much. And thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing during this time and just in general. Where can people learn more about the Duncan Joy and Childhood Foundation online if they'd like to do that? Uh, bringjoy, 
dot org um, is our main um, uh, website, and you can learn about what we're doing, and you can also uh, donate or be a part of some of our programming. Fantastic. We'll put that in the show notes, which you can find at engageforgood.com. Carrie, thank you again. We will look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, Keep up the good work. Thanks, Megan. Really appreciate your time.